Okay, English teacher friends. So for uh, this writing workshop, there's a little bit of a backstory that um, I want to preface before diving into uh, how to construct this essay using my templates. So at the time of this recording, it's early April and um, I'm finding you know, I still need to do quite a bit of work with argument and synthesis, um, you know, for my language students and my uh, gen ed uh, junior students as well. And engagement is low uh, at the moment, uh, even for me. And I know I, I talk to a lot of teachers on a daily basis, and there's this general malaise of apathy and disengagement and anti-intellectualism, and kids are kind of shutting down uh, a little too early for uh, our liking this year. So when I make a lesson plan, the very first thing I ask myself is this, how engaging is this going to be? And this lesson plan kind of just fell in my lap. Um, I have a daughter, 17, junior in high school, and she was showing me a meme uh, by Stephen Blake Crowder. So he's the host of a, a YouTube channel called Louder with Crowder. And it was a very politically loaded uh, comment. It just followed by the tagline of change my mind. And I was like, wow, what a great way to teach argument and synthesis and, and the concepts of persuasion in just terms of basic rhetoric. So I know from, uh, you know, being, you know, a teacher of teenagers for 20 years that with most of our kids, if you can get them talking about their music, man, oh, man, oh, man, will they go on forever and ever and ever. So I know for me personally, you know, as a teenager, the music I listened to was really pivotal in terms of shaping my identity, my worldview, and sort of, you know, how I construct meaning of the world. The music is very influential in my life and uh, for most of our students. And I was thinking, you know, how, how can I make a, a provocative statement uh, to, you know, take a deep dive into the principles of argument and synthesis? And I got it. I say this to my to my kids all the time. I have a 19 year old and a 17 year old and they hate it when I say this. And we've had so many heated uh, conversations about it. So here's my provocative statement today's music is garbage so in terms of setting up this um this unit my students walked in and i had the slide that you're looking at right in front of you right now projected on my overhead and i said let's have at it today's music is garbage and they were sitting in quads so groups of four and i said you know get your get your defenses you know challenge qualify defend refute my position and let's have a you know like a collective socratic seminar about this and um let's have at it do some research have some statistics have some data have some facts and uh you know target me change my mind and uh a lot of them surprisingly agreed with me they don't you know a lot of, a lot of kids don't like today's music i came to came to find out and uh, they listen i'm 47 and they're listening to journey and toto and crowded house and toad the west sprocket i'm like that's freaking awesome it's totally cool so uh i'll walk you through um how we approached everything from that socratic seminar to the actual construction of the argumentative synthesis paper uh while incorporating my templates so for those of you that are familiar with my work um this should be very familiar and i hope you sit back and say wow this dude is not joking new paper it's written the exact same way as all the others so the templates never change so for this uh, as always, you got to Bob Ross your instruction. So I wrote the paper with the students um, a couple of times. So I think I, I, I ended up doing a lot of modeling because I did this with my um, gen ed juniors who are really struggling. I, I found that uh, they took a big COVID hit. They're, they they write like uh, seventh and eighth graders, I'm finding, uh, even this late in the year. So big skill gap, big skill deficiency that I'm trying to help them bridge. So, um, 
you know, I always say this with teachers, you're the expert teacher, you're the expert writer uh, in the classroom. So write with your kids and uh, give them plenty of exemplars and models. So um, as I'm going to demonstrate for you uh, with my students, I just said, you know, hey guys, there's, you know, a couple of ways to go about doing an introductory paragraph. You can declare or invert. Here's three examples of how to declare. Here's three examples of how to invert on your mark, get set, go do it. When you model for your students how to write, uh, it totally demystifies the process, you know, and I, I always I always liken it to Bob Ross, you know, he got there at his easel with his canvas, his brush, his paints, and he painted uh, with us and, and walked us through the process. And even if we are like the most inept painter on earth, um, we can closely approximate what Bob Ross was doing. And uh, with practice, we definitely can uh, see improvement and become pretty adept painters if we um, do it enough. And the same goes for our student writers. So the question is this, how do I write the introductory paragraph? And as always, you know, we can declare or invert. And this works for rhetorical analysis, synthesis, literary analysis, argument, persuasion, research. There's two ways to do it. And um, uh, it works every single time. So if we're going to declare the thesis, we're going to begin with the thesis as succinctly, as declaratively, as concisely as possible. Boom, just drop the thesis. And we know that we're, we're going to, you know, basically grapple with that assertion of today's music is garbage. So you can agree, you can disagree, you can qualify it. Uh, those are the rhetorical positions or stances that you can uh, take. And then as always um, with introductions, I'm all about voice, rhythm, and flow. Uh, I want my students to have a nice academic quality to their writing. So um, I tell them to use some tier two level vocabulary. And by this, I just simply mean your average run of the, run of the mill SAT level words. Uh, I run an intensive word study academy uh, throughout the academic year. So my students' vocabs augment uh, pretty nicely over the, uh, the course of the year. And that's just kind of a staple of my mastermind. Um, and some of my professional developments that I offer. Uh, the other thing that I want to see in this is some context and background. Um, we've talked a lot in my other videos about sentence constructs. And for those of you that are new to this, um, Strunk and White in their uh, seminal text called um, Write It Right assert that there's 12 different ways to construct a sentence. And my students are really well versed in that because typically with struggling and emerging writers, you're going to get short, simple declarative sentence, short, simple declarative sentence. They just stack it. And they, uh, you know, typically um, students manipulate two or three sentence constructs. And there are a total of 12. So you're going to see my students have. Um, some nice supple flair with their um, with their syntactical manipulations uh, in, in order to achieve that voice rhythm and flow. And then here's the kicker. Introductions are always four sentences long. No more, no less. So you don't bring in anything extraneous. We don't want to have any um, source material. We're not going to plot summarize. We're not going to get into our evidence. We're just dropping a thesis. We are contending with that um, sort of aggressive assertion of today's music is garbage. And that's all we're focusing on. So that's the declarative. If we invert, we're just going to flip it. And in this case, you're going to begin with your context and background, sort of situate things. I know some teachers advise their students to do a hook and analogy um you know something along those lines it's not necessary you don't need to do that that can be kind of distracting for some students um but as you um funnel through you're going to end with the thesis so the fourth sentence is going to be the thesis and you sprinkle in all the additives the tier two level vocab the sentence constructs exactly four sentences uh take a stance so here is one uh, just to give you an example of how to do it. The glory days of the music industry are unfortunately in the rear view mirror. No matter how, my, how, how one may slice it, what is being produced today is of far less quality than the music that spans over the last five decades. 
Unlike the music that came from the classic rock genre, today's music will be forgotten and lost to oblivion because it is just quite simply dreadful. Every researchable data point supports this assertion. So you can see here, all you need to do, all right, this is very, very simple. Get the thesis up top or get it at the bottom. Some context background to flesh it out. Uh, focus on those sentence constructs. Get a little bit of tier two in there. And voila, that's, that's it. Every single time. That's how the template is to be manipulated. And, um, you know, when students can um, grasp a hold of this and manipulate it, they come up with some pretty good um, uh, theses to uh, uh, get anchored for the rest of their paper. So here's another one. And again, all they need to do, agree or disagree, take a stance. Nothing else comes into this, nothing extraneous. The boomers are always dissing, are always dissing and denigrating our generation for this and that. But when it comes to our music, they have it all wrong. Little do they remember that their music was also derided by their elders, as seems to be the case for every generation. The bottom line is this. Our music is just pushing a new envelope and is far better than the stuff of yesteryear. So let's break this down concretely. So you can see they're inverting. Right. We kind of have, you know, we know what, what 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 hand they're playing, you know, from up here. But just to get, you know, contextualized, get it situated, build the foundation and then, you know, some context and background. Last sentence, drop the thesis. Right. So we know that they're going to disagree with the assertion that today's music is uh, is garbage. The sentence constructs are pretty uh, are pretty good. I really like this last sentence here with the use of the hyphen. And one of the things that we were talking about with my students is the idea for voice that in a paper of this nature where, you know, it's kind of flip, you know, they're arguing with me. So I'm the reader, I'm the audience, I'm the one making the assertion, they're arguing with me. And I'm like, you don't need to be a pedantic, geeky, you know, uh, academic, I want to see you use some vernacular and colloquial to get um, that voice point. So this student um, did a really nice job of saying things like dissing, blend that with denigrating, and um, what else did they use? Um, this and that I thought was nice colloquial, but then it's blended with derided. Um, they used stuff yesteryear. So that nice teeter-totter balance of the colloquial, the vernacular, and the academic, I think is um, something that's teachable. And when kids can pull that off, it bodes really well in their voice. But as you can see here, um, nonetheless, this student is getting anchored uh, in a thesis. They have a position. And uh, all they did was manipulate the inverted thesis. So here is one more. If the focus gets narrowed to exclusively look at the rap industry, then yes, today's music is garbage. So this one declares, right? It's qualifying, it's getting specific. And we talked about that because, you know, just saying music, there's so much music, there's so many genres and subgenres, so much going on musically um, that, um, you know, I allowed kids to focus in on specifics, of course, and we did that in our um, Socratic seminar as well. So this one's declaring, and look at the complexity of that sentence, right? So that can be taught, and I have some videos in YouTube, in my YouTube channel, uh, with some exercises to teach kids how to write sentences like that. From my perspective, most contemporary rap songs adhere to a template that perpetuate needless hatred, violence, misogyny, homophobia, and toxic masculinity. Given that there are already so many negative things going on socially, an entire genre need not perpetuate it in the name of art. Unlike the hip-hop and rap music that spawn social movements advancing positive social change, today's music just makes matters worse so that was fantastic good declarative right context background tier two sentence constructs thesis up top or thesis at the bottom so you know my students have been doing this all year with me and um uh you know in terms of getting an, a, an introduction on paper 
really been demystified for most of them. They know what to do. Years down the road, there will not be radio stations in existence honoring the music of today. So they haven't necessarily taken the clear stance yet. So this is inverting. So we got to pay attention to that last sentence. Let's make sure that the thesis is coming in the last sentence. There is nothing timeless or redeemable or worthy of preserving in what is being produced for our generation. Everything is synthesized and mass produced and created by phony celebrities without an iota of talent. So listen to the thesis right here. Without doubt, today's music is pure garbage. So that was kind of a training wheel thing that I did with my students um, for this was, I said, if you if you just say the word garbage, you know, in your argument, you got to go back to the idea of garbage. So if you're really struggling with the with the, the concept and, and, and the know how of how to drop a thesis, if you focus on the idea of garbage, the assertion of garbage, you should end up having a thesis. And this was one of my students that was struggling a little bit. And I said, hey, last sentence, just say garbage and see what happens. And uh, he did. And it's just clear thesis, clearly took a stance. So one more, this is not an all or nothing proposition. So they get starting out qualifying it. So defend, qualify, challenge, refute. Yes, most of what is being produced today is fit for the garbage. And unfortunately, that's what gets the bulk of airtime. But there are some subgenres, especially within the indie folk category, that are making very meaningful music with messages that advance very important social causes. When music such as this makes for a better world, it certainly cannot be dubbed as garbage. You see the thesis comes at the end. And one of the cool things about Bob Rossing, my instruction for uh, my kids prior to them tackling this essay was I found strategically it was easier for me to invert the thesis than to declare. It just seemed more artful. It was more supple. Um, it, it, it's hard to just kind of just drop the thesis. You know, uh, you got to give some 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 reasons, some context, some background. Um, before you just drop the thesis. And uh, my students found that to be the case as well as they wrote. All right, so that's the introductions. And then the next question is this, as always, how do I construct the body paragraphs? And here's the kicker. So with this, there's a couple of directions you could possibly go. I, I really wanted to work on um, some synthesis with my juniors. And we've done a good deal of research uh, up until this point of the year. And I said, you know, you're, you're experts at this. So I want you to have um, some articles, some data, some statistics, some facts, something um, to bolster your position. So just do some research and uh, work it in. And I said, if you have like four to five sources that should be good but um you know i do i do want some textual support for this particular paper i could see very easily for if you wanted to to simplify things just to make this a straight up argumentative paper in the manner of an frq3 say for the uh, ap lang exam this would work well the kids can't have enough textual support from their head where they don't need to go on databases and into the internet um, to um, get articles and findings and things of that nature. But for this, uh, we did uh, uh, pretty much a synthesis paper. So you'll see my students fusing in their, um, their findings uh, in the second premise. So as always, 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 we are going to proceed syllogistically for this one. And for those of you that are new with my work, I'm going to quickly go over the syllogistic construct. Uh, I have a ton of other videos in my YouTube channel that go over this more thoroughly. So I'm just going to scratch the surface of this um, just as kind of a reminder for uh, most people. And if you want to take a deeper dive, just backtrack through some of those videos and take a look or you can contact me and uh, we can have a conversation. But in brief, the syllogistic method is rooted in the Aristotelian tradition. 
And Aristotle, just like composition teachers, was principally concerned with the idea of line of reasoning. So he ran a school called the Lyceum, and the rich aristocratic boys would go there to learn about polemics, oration, debate. And um, he, you know, Aristotle, like us, noticed that some students get really waylaid, wayward, bird walks. You know, they're not cogent. And he developed a heuristic called the syllogistic method to really ensure that students peg a line of reasoning. Uh, oftentimes, the scholars would debate questions like, uh, what is justice, right? So you have the book, for example, Plato's Republic, that centers around that question. And basically, all the philosophical think tanks come to the mic and they drop their definition of what justice is. And each definition is in syllogistic, uh, a, a syllogistic construct. And all that means is this. It's when you argue from premise, premise to conclusion. So... Take, for example, if I say something like this, premise one, arsenic is deadly. Premise two, my dog ate arsenic. Conclusion, my dog is going to die. When our students write, we want them to be that bulletproof, that cogent. We want them to be that locked into their line of reasoning. And unfortunately, uh, most of our students don't argue this way. Um, they're not very clear in, the, in their direction. And... Um, you know, if you equip students uh, with a template like this, their line of reasoning should be pretty, pretty good. So for the purposes of uh, constructing a synthesis paper, this is how that syllogistic construct is going to look. So the first premise is going to be an argument anchored in a why reason. And here's what I mean by that. Up top in the thesis, the student doesn't spell out the why. They're just articulating their their uh, their stance. So I agree, I disagree, or I'm going to qualify with the assertion. The whys are reserved for the body paragraph. So uh, we want that in the topic sentences. The second premise is the textual support, and I'd like to see a teeter-totter balance of quoting and paraphrasing. And then the conclusion. So not the conclusion of the essay. The conclusion of the syllogistic body paragraph is where the textual analysis occurs, and it's your links, your echo, your promise. So the, I always tell my students that the first premise is a promise. In the conclusion, you kind of want to go back and shake hands with that and, and, and really make sure that you're hammering your thesis in the end there. So all in all, since we're using templates, um, there's, there's guidelines, there's scaffolds and guardrails up. A syllogistic body paragraph should be about 10 sentences long. Those little itty bitty four, five, six sentence, uh, you know, body paragraphs that we get from students, they just don't hack it. There's not enough support. There's not enough analysis in there to really advance uh, an idea and flesh out an argument. So I say shoot for 10, hard cap at 12. I don't want to see a student go over 12 sentences in a syllogistic body paragraph. So let's take a look at, uh, at an example. In um, uh, on the uh, AP language exam for the synthesis paper, the college board always tells students, your argument must be central. And I say that for all the expository modes because expository writing is, is an act of arguing. So even literary analysis and rhetorical analysis is an argument. So I want them to argue. To make sure that that argument stays central and is clearly articulated, I want my students to take three sentences to set up the argument. So look at the first three sentences here, which comprise the first premise, and, and, and try to get a sense of what I mean by a why reason, right? So you took a stance in the thesis, drop the why. Why are you taking that stance? So look at what the student did here. The rap music that is being produced today is abhorrently bad. If you break down the lyrics, pretty much each song follows a cookie cutter approach. With rare exception, every mainstream rap song contains all of the following. A misogynistic statement that degrades or sexually objectifies women, uses the n-word needlessly and repeatedly, contains a sports illusion, and has some mention of graphic violence. Alright, this is really good. There's 
definitely a why reason there, right? We know why this student is saying that contemp most contemporary rap music is garbage, right? So you got to stay anchored in the prompt. You got your reasons. I always tell my students this, your first premise is a promise. And if we were to break down this uh, why reason into a promise, there's things that I'm expecting to see. So we're going to have a focus on rap music, clearly, uh, a discussion of misogynistic statements, uh, sexual objectification, the N-word, sports illusion, and violence. So if the promise is to be held true, all the textual support in the second premise should be germane to that scope, right? If we are to have a line of reasoning. So all the quotes in the paraphrasing, uh, paraphrases should be linked to the promise in the first premise. So beginning in the fourth sentence, we begin our uh, second premise. And I tell my students, get into your sources. Immediately get into your sources. So let's see what this student does. A recent article in Rolling Stone dissected the work of prominent artists like Eminem and Little Uzi. In looking at Eminem's latest release, Edgar Connors notes that the N-word is used 67 times and that there are 16 direct and graphic references to sexually objectifying women. All right, so that's some good textual support right there. That's totally germane to the promise, right? So that's all linked. Our line of reasoning is really good. So we get this one, two, three punch in the second premise of quote, paraphrase, analyze. In fact, most of his questionable lyrics aren't appropriate for a school paper, but here's a taste. I told the doc I needed change in sickness and gave a girl herpes in exchange for syphilis. Lil Uzi is no better, and these are just figureheads from the genre. In Lil Uzi's latest album, Connors also did a head count and found 88 uses of the N-word and 37 instances of explicit violence. And just like I expressed earlier, most of his lyrics are so profane that they are not suitable for the, cl for the classroom environment. And in terms of the cookie cutter formula, five of the songs make a sports illusion. All in all, there is no comparison between the music produced in the 60s versus what is being produced today. As we see, some 50 years later, there are still an abundance of radio stations playing classic rock. Jane Smothers notes that in the U.S. alone, there are over 13,000 stations exclusively devoted to the genre. She goes on to ask, do you think anyone will care enough about today's rap to have a station 50 years down the road playing it? So that's plenty of support, right? And it's all underneath the umbrella of the thesis and the first uh, premise. It's perfectly aligned. So in the end here, we have our links, our promise, our echo. I'll answer that question. I highly doubt it. Let's face it. The rap coming out today is garbage and of little value. It will be forgotten as soon as tomorrow gets here. So I gave my students... Um, a bit of a training wheel for the conclusion of the syllogism. I said, just to make sure you're uh, fully addressing the prompt, drop the word garbage. You got to go back to the prompt. You got to go back to the thesis. And that's what that student did here. The rap coming out today is garbage, right? And they threw it all back to the thesis. So that was pretty good. Um, pretty clear line of reasoning. Plenty of textual support, plenty of textual analysis. And it's cogent. It's pretty tight. Um, and then the same, you know, things that we were talking about in the um, introductions in terms of sentence constructs, voice, rhythm, flow, nuance, all the things that I'm always harping on my students about are, uh, are manifest in here. So for this paper, too, I did allow my students to say I, which um, you saw in this example, because they're arguing with me, right? I'm the audience. So um, I'm fine with that. If you want to stick to old school tradition and, uh, you know, the, the, the nature of the taboo of that word, then uh, by all means, have your students uh, go third person. But I was fine with it for this paper. So, all right. What do you do? 
if you gotta if you gotta keep on going in your essay how do you do it and the answer is bust out another syllogism so let's see another how another student manipulates the template so first three sentences set up the why reason all right so don't start quoting um, don't paraphrase just set up the why reason there's a subgenre of music that is making a huge political and social impact just as their 60s counterparts did Indie folk artists are carrying the torch of the likes of Bob Dylan and Woody Guthrie in that they are advocating for change in an era that is really in turmoil and flux. Today's political and social climate closely mirrors what was occurring during the 60s era, and to some extent, the music of today is just as good and meaningful. So it's rooted in the prompt, right? Um, and we got the why reason. So there's, you know, if we break this down into a promise, there are certain things that we should probably anticipate. So um, definitely a focus on indie folk, 60s era political social uh, music, and uh, kind of a juxtaposition between the two. So fourth sentence, let's get into the sources. Recently, at the New Newport Folk Festival, Rolling Stone interviewed several artists who are making a big impact on today's cultural scene. Megan Ryder asked several musicians to perform a song that questioned the political apparatus of today that also asked for change. The Neilds, a little-known band, performed Jesus is a Refugee. Asked about its meaning, Narissa Neild said that the song is an invitation for all of us to treat each other like family. Gregory Allen Isaacoff, another indie folk singer, commented that one of his songs is a reworking of America the Beautiful. Isaacoff said that he is particularly drawn to the idea of brotherhood in our divided times. With his music, he wants to bring the hope and connection we experienced at Pete Seeger concerts. Most of our music critics will assert that the music of today is trite and inconsequential as compared to the music produced in the 60s. But I disagree. As we can see by just turning on our television sets or scrolling through social media outlets, times are changing and many contemporary singer-songwriters are speaking loudly about these events. All right, so we got some support, got some analysis, right? And uh, we want to keep it beneath 12 sentences. Let's wrap it up. While pop and rap and hip-hop are doing their own thing, the indie folk musicians are carrying a brightly burning torch that is seeking to unite us as Americans. This message is so important to be hearing, especially given how divided we are as a country at the moment. So just a different take, right? So different thesis statement, but argued um, with the, within the parameters of the exact same template. First premise, second premise, conclusion. Keep the line of reasoning super tight, super cogent. Don't bring in anything extraneous. Keep the promise of the first premise. Echo it all back at the end. So students can do that uh, all day long. So they had a good time with that particular paper. Like I said, getting them to talk about music um, usually um, engages them, you know, and they have, they have a lot to say about the music that they are, uh, um, you know, ingesting so all right so hopefully you found that to be useful and can use it in your classroom to teach argument and synthesis and to wrap things up know that um i'm doing uh monthly webinars with uh the national writing project so at the time of recording this it's april and um April 26th, I have uh, a webinar that I'm doing with them on my alternative grading methods, and each month we'll just do a different topic. So that's what's on the, uh, the forecast for this month. Uh, so that's with Perfection Learning. Uh, doing some work with the National Writing Project as well. Um, I'm not sure if you guys heard in the group, but uh, Tim Freitas, Brandon Abden, and I have been selected to uh, host a um, presentation at the National Council of Teachers of English in the fall. So we got that iron in the fire. Tim Freitas and I are collaborating on a textbook together where we're going to highlight our templates and basically um, band together around the idea that there's many ways to um, you know, skin the compositional fish. So his templates are a little different than mine, but good writing's good writing. 
and uh, one of the things I'm doing to kind of gather some research for um, that textbook with Tim is I'm working with some teachers in something that I called the Teach It Right Five Week Mastermind. So at present, um, we've decided to work Thursday nights, uh, five uh, consecutive Thursday nights starting at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I'm basically equipping these real, you know, uh, eager beaver teachers with my templates, my alternative grading methods, my Plato Plato discussion, like the whole arsenal of my wacky ideas that they take into the classroom as they look to revamp, retool, kind of rethink uh, their approach to composition and, um, you know, ELA. So if you're interested in uh, joining forces for that Teach It Right five week mastermind, you can drop me a line at teachinghowtowrite.com. Uh, I also have a web page, teaching, uh, teachinghowtowrite.com. Uh, you can get more information there. And um, my email is teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com. So if you would like the um, uh, PowerPoint that I just showed you in this presentation. I'm more than happy to send that off to you um, for your own classroom use if you want to run this unit. And uh, I guess that does it. So be well for now. Happy teaching and happy writing.